right, so that'll be April 6th. Yeah, it'll be, uh, it, it won't be sitting here, maybe by the start we will, uh, but it'll be just a time of social time and, and testimony. So, but like we did last year, the mic is open for anybody that wants to share what is, where God has touched you and how he's touched you throughout these, this time. And uh, then we'll finish the night over there. It's nice. So I, I, I think that's a pretty good deal. So I'm done talking to Daniel. So although 
we believe conceptually that we could die tomorrow, for most of us, we will continue to live the next 24 hours as though we won't. And that's just the truth. Because that belief isn't as strong as what we call a convictional belief. A convictional belief is something that we hold with conviction. Instead of merely believing that it's a possible truth for us, it is an actual truth. Hence, a convictional belief will always, and I say always, shape and influence our lives, our thinking, the way that we interact with the world. See, if I convictionally believe that I am going to die tomorrow, you better believe that my life is going to look drastically different today. So when the Bible speaks about a belief, it presupposes the kind of convictional belief that influences our lives and our thinking. So to believe in the teachings of Jesus Christ is to hold the kind of belief which reveals itself through our actions, through our choices. In fact, and I was on my argument, every habit, every choice that we make, every action that we take is in some way a reflection of what we truly, convictionally believe in our hearts, deep down inside. So man, if we believe in Jesus in this convictional way, His teachings will manifest themselves through our lives. And that's what the Bible presupposes when it calls us to believe. So this naturally flows into the second part of this definitional statement because a Christian believes in the teachings of Jesus Christ, he or she will also obey the teachings of Jesus Christ. So tonight we are going to begin to segue into a discussion of what the Bible means by obedience. And this will be kind of like a part one. And next week we'll go deeper into this aspect of obedience to Jesus. But before we jump into that, I thought it was necessary for us to kind of prep the soil for that. So this week will kind of be an introduction into the second part of this, which is obedience of Jesus' teachings. Now follow along with me. Nearly 2,000 years ago, a handful of men traveled across Palestine into Asia Minor and then into modern-day Greece, spreading the good news of Jesus Christ everywhere that they went. As these followers of Jesus went about spreading this good news, they rapidly and radically impacted the world in which they came into contact with. When these men came into a city for the first time, the people knew that they had been there. The evidence of this is found in the book of Acts, particularly in chapter 17. The early disciples of Jesus traveled halfway across the known world at the time into a region that they had never entered into before. So nearly 20 years after Jesus was crucified and rose from the dead, Paul and company proclaimed Jesus to the crowds in Thessalonica, and the crowds responded by saying this about these men. They looked at him and they said, these men who have turned the world upside down have also now come here. Please catch the significance of this. Merely 20 years after Jesus' resurrection, 20 years, can you picture what you were doing 20 years ago if you're that old? I mean, it wasn't that long ago, right? It's half of a generation, which if a generation is 40 years, merely 20 years after Jesus' resurrection, these handful, and I say handful, of Jesus' followers were charged with having turned the world upside down. And this charge took place in a region that was halfway across the known world at the time, and these people in Thessalonica had never, ever met a Christian before this time. Yet the reputation of these Christians preceded them into this city. Now let's quantum leap up into our day and age. Let's fast forward the tape about 2,000 years later. According to recent statistics, there are approximately 2.8 billion professing Christians in the world today. That is roughly one-third of the Earth's total population. 
In the United States alone, there are roughly 247 million Christians. That is approximately 70% of our own country's total population. <laughs> now, here's the question I really want you to think about. If just a handful of disciples, which literally was less than 0.05% of the total population of the time, were responsible for turning the entire known world upside down on its head at that time, what do you think 247 million Christians can today can do in impacting our world today? In other words, if just a handful could turn the world upside down, what can 240 million of us do today? Now, it would seem as though 247 million Christians would not only turn the world upside down, but would completely turn the world inside out and radically transform the world as we know it. Yet, as many of us know, that doesn't seem to be what is happening today. According to many recent polls conducted by research institutes, that's not what's happening at all. With a country touting 70% of its own population as being Christians, here are what these researchers are finding in our day. The following polls reflect our nation's perception of Christianity's impact on our country. In regards to the influence of Christianity on the amount of violence that takes place within our society, 39% of the people polled, which is a representation of our country, say that Christianity certainly does have a positive influence or impact. But 61% of Americans say that Christianity has no impact, or even perhaps impacts our nation negatively. What about ethics in the business world? 34% of the Americans polled say Christianity is a positive influence on, on business ethics in our country, while 66% say that Christianity either makes no impact or even may even have a negative impact on the ethics in our world. How about the amount of substance abuse in our society, drug and alcohol addiction? <coughs> Excuse me. 33% of America says that Christianity has a positive influence on this. But double that. 66% say that Christianity has no impact whatsoever on the nature of addiction, the crisis that we face in our country with people who are plagued by addictions. How about how Christianity impacts the influence of the environment or impacts treating the, the environment in, in positive ways? 30% of uh, the people polled say that Christianity has a positive influence, while 70% of the people polled say that it has no impact, if not a negative impact. Here's another big one. What about racism in our society? 33% of the people that were polled, which represents the United States, say that Christianity positively influenced and impacts racism in our country. But more than double that. 67% see no real impact or even a negative impact on the amount of racism in our society with Christianity's contributions. Now, this is a side note. And you don't have to accept all of these statistics. These are what people are saying about the church. And to be honest with you, I don't agree with everything I'm reading to you here, but we need to be knowledgeable of what people think about us if we're going to try to reach out to them. But as a side note, Evangelical Christians ranked highest in objecting to having neighbors of different ethnicities. Just 27% of the population polled believe that the Christian faith positively, positively impacts how the rest of the world views the United States, while 73% believe that our impact and influence on this country actually causes harm in the rest of the world. These are just a few. But this sort of indifferent view 
on Christianity's impact on society, then, is steadily increasing within our generation. The worst thing about these polls is not that people have a purely negative view of Christians or Christianity. You know, I think I could handle that. I think I could handle if people had a negative view of Christianity. That means they at least notice us. The worst thing is that for the overwhelming majority, they simply view Christianity as being non-impactful at all. For them, it's a non-factor. And so they are indifferent to it because they view it as being irrelevant to our society's problems and biggest issues. I mean, for them, in a lot of ways, it would be like me asking you, so tell me, how do you feel unicorns impact racism in the United States? You would look at me like, what? Unicorns are completely irrelevant to the question of racism. What are you talking about? Maybe this is a bit of an over-exaggeration, but for many people, we have that little of an impact that we are just such a non-factor to them that it's not even worth discussing. But are these poems speaking about Christians in general? Or do they reflect Bible-believing, born-again Christians? I mean, 270 million Christians, 247 million Christians, are these all real Christians? Well, it, it certainly is true that when we're talking about these numbers, they do reflect anybody that checks off their preference of Christianity as being their preferred religion. But here's some more things I want you to consider. I want you to listen to this very clearly. This was taken from an article in Christianity Today, and I quote, the finding in numerous national polls conducted by highly respected pollsters like the Gallup Organization and the Barna Group are simply shocking. Gallup and Barna has handed us survey after survey demonstrating that evangelical Christians, that's us, are just as likely to embrace lifestyles that are every bit as hedonistic, that's purely pleasure-seeking, materialistic, self-centered, and sexually immoral as the world in general. Divorce is more common among born-again Christians than in the general American population. White evangelicals are most likely to object to people of neighbors of another race. The sexual promiscuity of evangelical youth is only a little less outrageous than their non-evangelical peers. And tragically, the percentage of Christian men involved in pornography is not much different than the unsaved. End quote. Now perhaps it is true that many born-again Christians do not engage in the things that we just mentioned here, that the article mentioned here. But the question still remains, are we engaging at all? Because according to these stats, it seems as though Christians are having very little to no impact on our society these days. So rather than us 247 professing, million professing Christians receiving the same accusations as Paul and Thessalonica for their impact in the world, for having turned it upside down. It seems as though in our day and age, the world is turning us upside down. It appears that rather than being an influence within the world, many professing followers of Jesus are being influenced and transformed and even conformed to the world itself. Rather than following Jesus, many of us who profess Jesus are following the secular herd mentality that teaches us that it's really all about us and our personal happiness here in this life. So as a result, rather than being a shining light in the dark world, Christians now find themselves blending into the shadows of obscurity within our nation, at least according to these polls. But the question is, why is this happening? Why is the influence and impact of Christianity within a nation that was really founded upon biblical ethics and principles declining so rapidly? Well, I think that's a pretty complex question. It's, very, it's not easy to answer, but I don't think 
I would be missing the mark if I said that the big part of the reason why Christianity, generally speaking, is not making as much of an impact today as it used to is because, quite simply, we no longer stand out as being any different than anybody else. Our divorce rates are about the same, if not higher. Pornography viewing is about the same for Christians as non-Christians. Sexual promiscuity among Christian young adults is about the same as their non-Christian peers. Sex outside of marriage is about the same for professing Christians as it is for non-professing Christians. And as many as our country see it, professing Christians don't seem to have any greater commitment to the poor, to the outcast, to the marginalized people in our society than non-Christian people. Hence, if Christianity isn't making a difference for its professed followers, then why should they care about it? Why should the world follow us when we are often lagging behind them? If we compare our modern version of Christianity to what we read in the Bible, it's not hard to determine, to determine that something is wrong, that something is missing, that somehow we are missing the mark of what it means to be a Christ follower in our day and age. Perhaps a large part of this is due to our failure to obey our King's commands. Jesus gives us the blueprint to life, but perhaps because of our failure to believe and trust in Him, and hence act upon those beliefs, we take matters into our own hands. We want to be in the driver's seat. And we want to do whatever we think will be, bring us the most happiness and the most pleasure in this life. So that we either, in doing so, outright disobey Jesus or just ignore Him altogether. And man, I confess that I am as guilty as the next man. It breaks my heart. Jesus is very clear about what following him entails. In the Gospel of John, chapters 14 and 15, Jesus repeats a phrase no less than five times. Now, man, if the Bible says something once, that's all we need. If it says it twice, we had better listen. But if it says it five times within a relatively short section of the pages of the Bible, well, it's almost as if it's beating us over the head with it. So what does Jesus say five times in a relatively short span of Scripture? In the opening verses of Jesus' great discourse recorded in the Gospel of John, Jesus says this, in John 14, 15, If you love me, then you will obey what I command. For Jesus, this is simple, conditional logic. If X, then Y. For example, if you stop breathing, then you will die. If you drink too much, then you will get drunk. If you love me, then you will obey me. Jesus continues in John 14, 21. Whoever has my commands and obeys them, he is the one who loves me. Now here's the same kind of simple logic in reverse. If you are dead, then you have stopped breathing. If you are drunk, you probably drank too much. If you obey my commands, then that means you really love me. John 14, 23, Jesus repeats it again. If anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching. In John 14, 31, Jesus demonstrates this kind of logic by his own example of how he obeys the Father because he loves him. He says, but the world must learn that I love the Father and I do exactly what he has commanded me. In other words, because X, then Y. Because I love the Father, I do what he says. John 15, 10, we see the same simple logic yet once again. Jesus is trying to get a point across, man. If you obey my commands, then you will abide in my love, just as I obey my Father's commands and remain in His love. So what does it mean to truly be a Christian? According to Jesus' 
simple logic, if you believe, if you love Him, you will seek to obey Him. No matter the cost, no matter the price, no matter the sacrifice. So a Christian is one who has a conviction or belief in Jesus that leads to obedience of His teachings. There is no middle way through this. If you believe in the teachings of Jesus, then you will act upon those beliefs by obeying what He commands us. If you don't think it's important to obey Jesus, then using His own simple conditional logic, if you don't think it's important to obey Jesus, then you don't really believe in Him. It certainly could be said that you don't love Him. Because when it comes to Christ, men, to believe is to obey. But this raises a million dollar question. What commands does Jesus give to us that we are to obey? I mean, I thought that we are living under a dispensation of grace. We are no longer under the curse of the law. We are no longer required to observe the law in order to inherit eternal life. It's given to us freely, the Bible teaches us. So what exactly does Jesus mean when he says, if you love me, you will obey me? Next week. Next week we will further unpack what it means to obey the teachings of Jesus Christ. And what I hope we will all begin to see is this. When the church is obeying the teachings of Jesus Christ, the world cannot help but take notice because it is flipped upside down. And when we are abiding in the teachings of Jesus Christ, the church is at a most fruitful period and at her happiest. For the pathway to reaching the loss for Christ and the pathway to freedom and joy always run along the parallel path of true belief and obedience. Next week we'll reflect upon what it means to obey Jesus. What exactly does that mean? And we'll take a look at the church's impact upon the world when she was being obedient to her King. So if we love Jesus, then we will want to learn what He's calling us to do. You don't want to miss next week. I figured I'd keep this one short for you because I just wanted to pray. Heavenly Father, we love you. We want to be obedient to your commands. Give us your favor out of a response of gratitude. God, we want to honor you. But it's so hard. I know it's so hard for me. I know your love never runs out for me. No matter how many times I fall short. And I pray for these men sitting here today that they would know that they are loved by you. And be encouraged to follow the teachings of your Son that lead us to life. You're not trying to lay demands down on us because you want to prohibit us. You want to liberate us. You want us to experience a true sense of joy that this world can never offer us, but the pathway to get there is by following your Son, by picking up our cross. Help us to know that. Help us to believe that. Help us to follow you. I know that every man here, Lord, is here. Because in their hearts, they want to follow you. By your Spirit, through your grace, enable us to do so. I pray for the groups this evening. Lord, may you have your way with us. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>